Namaskar, hello and welcome to Daily Global Insights. I'm your host Sri Ayer and joining me is Sridhar Chityala ji. This is episode number 118, March 15, 2021. The main points in today's news are as follows. There is two different types of meetings going on. The first one uh, that concluded uh, last week, a new dawn, Quad leaders vow to define the Indo-Pacific century, new group of nations. Second one that is coming up this weekend is Anthony Blinken and Jake Sullivan will be meeting Wang Yi and security officials of PRC, People's Republic of China. China's new dam on Brahmaputra on the lower reaches of Yarlung Zango River is not a concern, but it is an eco-disaster. Blinken and Austin will have two plus two meetings with Japanese counterparts Toshimitsu, Motegi, and Nobuo Kishi. And now on the Quad update, a new dawn. Quad leaders vow to define the Indo-Pacific century, a new group of nations. So what is really interesting here is they have come up with three different commitments. Plus, there was an article that appeared in, I think, Washington Post that had four different global leaders penning that thing. It was a combined article by uh, Joe Biden, Narendra Modi, and, and the Japanese Prime Minister and the uh, Australian Prime Minister. Well, I think the, um, the whenever Washington Post or New York Times uh, gets involved in publishing any of these articles, you have to really take it with a pinch of salt. You know, I'm calling the spade a spade. A quad is established as a strategic deterrence, and it was started by none other than Shinzo Abe going back 2007. To say that a new dawn of the century, our first priority is COVID, second priority is Green Accord, and third priority is around open and free Indo-Pacific uh, pathways or Indo-Pacific, uh, um, uh, what you call maritime boundaries. You know, to some extent, it's almost like, uh, you know, a tail leading the, tail leading the, the dog which is effectively to say you needed to come to your resolution, you have come to your resolution, and which is around the whole kind of COVID. Remember, again, they are using COVID as a mechanism whereby India is the producer, Australia is the distributor, and Japan and United States will fund these 1 billion vaccines to be manufactured. I've check has just taken one item out in a, within a kind of a context and, and stating uh, the, the kind of the narrative around what you are saying around the Washington Post. To me, it is a ceremonial, figurative kind of a statement. Often, it does not achieve the strategic objectives. So therefore, whatever you want, however you want to take the Washington Post, you can take it. Now, COVID-19 vaccine diplomacy tops the agenda. India is going to manufacture, Australia to distribute, and US and Japan will be funding 1 billion vaccines for global needs. This is, this is one of the good agreements that came out of the Quad, isn't it? It's a, it's a great agreement, uh, you know, but it does it to need to be part of Quad, is my question. Quadrilateral is around the trade, is around commerce, and it's around security. So to me, I think it is a byproduct. An agreement that was reached prior which is around the rare yes, to me, is a good agreement. Whereas here, you know, it's great. They are trying to address a human disaster which has engulfed. Naturally, it is, it is at least there is a theory that it is started from China. So therefore, it is very appropriate that forum is the forum uh, that, that is more appropriate within the kind of context of the first, uh, whatever, you know, the, uh, the, 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 global leaders kind of statement coming out of that thing. To that extent, I agree. But it, to me, it doesn't kind of really align with the strategic agenda with which Quad was established. Again, I want, we're going to have a separate discussion. We didn't have it because if you recall, we talked about it. We'll have a separate discussion uh, around this topic. We're waiting for some developing events. And once that happens, then we would have a more strategic, important framework. Quad is established with three principal objectives. One, preserving the sovereignty of the islands and nations around the South China, East China uh, area, stretching up to Indian Ocean. Second, it is to preserve a significant amount of natural resources, as well as the maritime uh, passages, free and uh, open passages on the maritime. And the third is the whole kind of 
uh, ecosystem around fisheries and so on and so forth. This is the purpose with which Quad was established, but we seem to have slightly deviated in that strategic agenda. So that's fine because of the relevancy. But I really would like to always go back to the what's the framework under which Quad was established. And Defense Minister Lloyd Austin, or we should say Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, will be visiting India to provide further clarity. I think he's going this week, right? He's, uh, he's reaching there on Wednesday. Monday and Tuesday they have meetings, which is today uh, they will have would have completed the meetings in Japan. There's a two plus two dialogue going on between, uh, obviously that's why you have Anthony Blinken and you also have Lloyd Austin uh, meeting with the, the appropriate officials from the Japanese side. So, um, Going, looking at uh, the other side, Alaska, the, US, the, the United States and China are going to have a summit. On the U US side, we are going to have Anthony Blinken and Jake Sullivan, and they'll be meeting with Wang Yi, who is, I think, the foreign minister of PRC, and other security officials. Was this not supposed to be a Biden versus the Prime Minister Lake King meeting, sir? What happened? Well, I think that the um, it seems to have been... Uh, to some extent watered down, if I have to use that principle. Um, and I think um, PRC uh, set the right context. In fact, Lee K. King set the context, which is to say, hey, you know, we need to recalibrate the relationship, tone down the rhetoric, don't interfere in our affairs as far as Hong Kong, Uyghur, Tibet, you know, any of these things are concerned. Uh, it is part of our uh, sovereign rights. Uh, let us look at uh, re restarting and resetting the trade relationship. He seems to have thrown the first coin. Uh, Jake uh, Sullivan, in his briefing, mentioned um, to to the to the press corps, which is to say that look, the agenda is not about tariffs, but it is around what areas we can cooperate and what areas we agree that we have a conflict. And. Um some of the bans on Chinese companies with closer proximity to the PLA will continue to remain, isn't it? Huawei stays. The only thing that has, seems to have got uh, a concession uh, is um, um, Xiaomi, uh, the, the phone company. So they seem to have got their uh, ban lifted. And so Xiaomi will be back in action uh, in the United States. Um, so therefore, at least to, to some extent, the policies of the Trump, in, Trump administration seems to be staying. And in, finally, the generals in the U.S. Army have been raising the rhetoric on Chinese threat with U.K. and other commanders. What is this threat, sir? So there are, there is, uh, the threat is around, the China's threat is imminent. There is, an, there is an imminent conquest and invasion of Taiwan in 2022, coinciding with this uh, Congress. They believe that somewhere between 2022, 23, this will happen. Another set of generals have said that the war, the, the confrontation with China will be on land. So therefore, United States must be, must be ready. The same has been said by the commanders of the United Kingdom. So therefore, there seems to be a set within the army which is going on one track in terms of the imminency or imminent threat emerging from China. And then you have this, this is where I'm critiquing the, uh, now you can understand the context behind why I'm criticizing the COVID outcome. The COVID outcome is completely silent on the core issue, which is this Taiwan. If you recall that the Chinese... Uh, Army went through the Taiwan Strait, United States went thrice, Indian Navy went through once, the German Navy went, the French, the Japanese, all passed through this little Taiwanese Strait, showing their solemn support for the independence of Taiwan, recognizing. They also showed the solemn support for Senkaku. And when you ask the question, what is this? This is the imminent threat they are referring to. This particular region seems to be the next point of confrontation between U.S. and China uh, and Taiwan and Japan emanating in that area. So I think this is the th threat that they are alluding to. So you almost have a fracture. You have this meeting in Alaska. 
you had this meeting in uh, in in um, uh, the virtual meeting of the Quad, and then you have the rhetoric and the noise that is coming from the the U.S. generals. And in other news, the fourteen hundred dollar stimulus checks are now being going to hit people's uh, accounts, isn't it? Yes, in fact, in uh, some of the people, maybe sir, you already got it in your account. Uh, so some of the people would have. Um, uh, received uh, funds into the account. Uh, it's those who are electronic would have received it. It's a great news, um, and you know people generally seems to be you know well disposed that they're getting their money. And Yellen says that the tax increases will come when funds are needed for other priorities, just not now. So there is a, a differing. This is the thing that has been happening for a long time, sir. The question that's been asked is: We already close to four point one trillion. We are adding another $2.1 trillion. The question being asked is, how are you going to fund all this uh, when you have uh, such a big number that uh, to, to kind of accommodate? Um, I think that we were 14.3% uh, deficit of GDP in 2020. Uh, we'll be about 11% about without additional spending coming in, 11% of the, uh, of the or 10.5% of the GDP. So there's marked questions being raised around as to how are you going to fund all this in the medium to long term. Interest rates are great, bond rates are rising, how is this going to be funded? So Yellen is saying, we don't, we don't need anything right now, but if we have, we will be doing more, when we do more, we will be raising taxes. So now that we have talked about numbers, I have put up the first chart, which is the budget product projections under CBO for up to 2051. And would you like to talk about this a little bit because this, but the deficit and debt are going totally out of control. Yeah, so I think that uh, with your permission, once you put up that chart, I will use my phone here. Yes, uh, yes. Look at, yes. The, look at the same chart. Yes. So I think that what, what we are pointing out here is that when you take a look at the key numbers uh, that you need to look at is the revenue line. When you take a revenue line between now and 2019 or 2020, 2021, 2021 is 16% of GDP is the revenue. That is the one that they, by, by way of uh, revenue collected through personal taxes, corporate taxes, and other kinds of stuff. When you look at that from 2021 to 2020, 2051, the increase is very, very small, 18.5% of the GDP, right? On 30 years, we have moved almost at a tail, uh, uh, snail's pace. Then take a look at the... Um, um, the uh, the spending the spending is 26.3 percent of GDP and 2051 is 31.8. So on a scale of for a two uh, percentage points increase in revenue over this period, there is a five percentage point increase in expenses per right? year yeah. on the expenses on the mm -hmm. spending on the spending. When I say that is 26.3 to 31.8, is about 5.5. Okay, right? right, right, right. Right, so, so therefore, there's almost 2.5 times the growth in expenses relative to the income, right, relative to the revenue. So this puts a tremendous pressure on the deficit, the total debt. That is why you are saying that debt going from 102% in 2021 to 202% by the time you get to 2051. This is factoring in no new kind of incremental debt coming into the balance sheet of the budget. Now, take a look at the, uh, the net interest. Net interest is the one that you pay on the borrowings that you make. When you take a look at the net interest, it is today around 1.6, 1.4% of the GDP. We discussed this in our budget projections, right, which is basically the re-architecting of the balance sheet using the 10-year, 30-year lower cost of funds available right now, that is lower cost of borrowing. This grows to 8.6%, as high as 5.2% in 2040 in about 20 years, right? We are having great time in the next 10 years as the, as the interest is only 1.4 to 2.2%. Then there is a jump of 3% in terms of the cost on the balance sheet, okay? So again, they, what are the main line items here? The main line items are the healthcare is a big line item. Then you have the net interest, which is a big line item. Healthcare is mandatory. 
social security is mandatory then you see the uh, the discretionary spending which is you know all the kind of stuff that you spend money on but net net interest is another big line item which is driving the expense or the spending and which in turn is contributing towards this growing gap between revenue and expense and hence the doubling of the debt of the us balance sheet effectively we are sinking without any kind of programs the more and more you borrow is basically going to put a non manageable balance sheet in terms of having any flexibility in terms of how to address future disasters and um, nancy pelosi is kicking off a big bold transformational infrastructure deal of about 2 trillion dollars now we this is just a new one coming down the pipeline so there is more expenses um so that is also going to put more stress on uh, the debt isn't it it is and uh, that is where uh, yellen and uh, this progressive group have come up with this concept which we again touched on our prior shows which is there is this um, uh, those who are 500 million dollars to 1 billion dollars uh, wealth they will have a 1% wealth tax those who are above 1 billion dollars they will pay an extra 2% wealth tax uh, which is a no no to the republicans there is also a tax that is being contemplated by janet yellen which is 10% tax for those companies which are keeping x percentage of revenue and profits overseas a 10% flat tax on the overseas revenue this doesn't augur very well this will also be a no no as far as republicans are concerned so this is their funding mechanism as far as the future debt is concerned but they are stopping with these taxes as a source of uh making up but they're also trying to say that they're going to do more this uh, universalization of uh, uh the basic income uh and the 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 child tax credits which were given $3000 for those above 6 below 17 and then $3600 for those who are above 6 or those below 6 they say they see that as the beginning of the harmonization of everybody getting paid now how much will all these tax measures net them per year sir in terms of how many billion dollars uh the the uh, that uh, there it is not fully quantified as yet in terms of the specific benefit uh but there is definitely to some extent uh it will converge on the curve converge on the on the the spending to revenue gap because it's a spending to some extent it will converge but it's not going to converge to the extent of uh you know you can see already um the 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 deficits we are we were around 4.6 to 5% we are today already you know crossing uh, last year i can understand 14.3 this year i can understand as of now 10.3 it is likely to blow out but very quickly we are moving into the 10% gap which is considered a unhealthy way of managing the balance sheet in a public finance con in a context typically the number that is always mentioned is 4 to 6% once upon a time the rating agencies will dump your bond if you are about 2% 2 to 4% of your g 2 to 4% deficit of your gdp is considered a bad way of managing public finances but us has opened a new chapter in this whole concept of deficits Sir, uh, while we are at uh, deficit, let's take a look at the second drawing, which is the COVID funds, mm-hmm. and and there there is a lot of unspent funds available for this administration to splurge on. Or I won't say splurge on, but at least they can use that also, isn't it? I mean, this is on top of the one point nine. Use it. They're going to use it. They're not. It's not going to. Sorry, I'm just going to go back and look at my diagram. They're going to use it. Close to a trillion dollars they have not spent before they did the next two trillion dollars. Right. Of which close to 390 billion dollars is on ppp you know you remember you were saying about many people they not get this ppp loans the loans closed early all these kinds of things so a lot of those things is around the 390 billion dollars is around the ppp the healthcare benefits that flow with it kind of the augmented direct payments part of it that still has not occurred so that's going to happen but that roughly constitutes 40% of the 1 trillion unspent then there is a 340 billion dollars which is about 34% of the unspent money 
This is around what they call as the, um, no, the economic uh, disaster recovery loans. You know, people who are suffering from whole set of consequences as a result of that. So 34% of that money has not been spent. Then you have 10%, 19% or 20% is called a pay over time. This I can understand. This is the health care rebates, you know, tax credit rebates, you know, child care rebates, unemployment. So all these kinds of things that still needs to be sent. That's 190. Now, let, let, let's look at the last number. 70 billion. 7% is unquantified, not allocated, to be allocated as to missing incomplete data as to where the 70 billion go. So this is one trillion to be put into the money. Now we actually can go in and you know dig and you know report back as we did last time. What the hell is this 70 billion dollars that they have not yet unquantified? But just tells you how callous way the government works in United States. The only thing is it's sophisticated as the world's leading economy, but in terms of the practices, this is a demonstration to the world, which we're pointing out through this show that basically to say it is no good or no better than any of the other kind of economies in terms of how the spending is done. Overall balance sheet management may be you know, com uh, compliant with the best practices, but in terms of the spending, it is very frivolous. Uh, Charles Schumer uh, has said that Biden team needs to be very clear on border crisis. So you would not term him a progressive, sir? Charles Schumer, Chuck Schumer? Chuck Schumer sits between uh, progressives and uh, left. So therefore, you know, he hasn't still fully advanced to the left of the leftmost, right? So, but he is still, you know, very much supportive of uh, the, the progressive agenda. So, but it's very clear. He's got two crises because we don't have enough time here. You know, we have crisis in New York, which is all the saga around Andrew Cuomo. He is involved in part of that asking Cuomo to get out. We have whole issues around the management of the healthcare stuff. We got, you know, that's something that he's left. He's focused really on, he thinks that this could effectively bring the Democrats down to its knees because it is becoming a very big disaster. Now they have sent FEMA over the weekend because they're not able to tackle. Now I hear there's a lot of these kids um, with no parents are being left along the border with the hope that they will come to this side or that side and along with all other kinds of things. The COVID, the number of people who are affect, afflicted with COVID, they are, they are not, they are what you call courtesy testing and being sent into the community. One number estimates this to be close to 25% of the people who are coming in are COVID affected. And um, Trump makes a surprise appearance at fundraisers and hints at Lara Trump, a uh, Lara Trump run for Senate in 2022. Um, now, how is Lara Trump related to Donald Trump, sir? Uh, she is uh, the um, daughter-in-law of um, the... Um, so Eric Trump's wife. Eric Trump's wife. Eric Trump's wife, yeah. She's the daughter-in-law of... Uh, uh, she's from North Carolina. She's uh, expected to um, expected to contest uh, from North Carolina. So Don Trump's... Uh, Don Trump Jr.'s younger brother, uh, Eric Trump's wife, is Lara Trump. And now t let's take a look at India, South Asia news. I'm going to put up the image deck again, sir, of the Brahmaputra. China's new dam on Brahmaputra on the lower reaches of Yarlung Zangbo River is not a concern, but it is an eco disaster. How so? I'm putting up this uh, deck now, sir. Well, I think the, uh, so again, I'll go back to my, sure. uh, uh, the, the charts, okay, which you are looking at. So when uh, you look at the um, um, Yarlung Sangpo River, so you can see that uh, it is in the Tibetan Plateau. It makes its curve uh, around uh, just past Ningchi uh, into Arunachal Pradesh and then flows through Arunachal Pradesh into Gauhati, Assam, and so on and so forth. So the dam is in the lower reaches. There was consider it was considered to be. Um, uh, considered to be uh, a problematic in terms of water flooding and shortages, etc. So the story was that whether it really is going to be creating drought and water issues, the Indian, uh, you know, meteorological and um, eco-environmental people seems to have studied and they've come to the conclusion 
when you actually look at Brahmaputra, which is actually the next kind of diagram, we won't go into it, um, uh, or you can go into it, or we'll, we'll discuss it when we go into it. Brahmaputra is fed by a number of tributaries in India. So therefore, the Brahmaputra being, uh, you know, going dry and not enabling the, the farming and the ecosystem of India does not arise. But they have said that it is an eco... Why is it an eco-disaster? It's an eco-disaster because this is not the only dam. We have covered this extensively in uh, a separate kind of uh, a special program that we ran as to the number of dams that uh, China is constructing. And basically what it does is um, it, it feeds off a number of uh, what you call the ecosystems around the Bhutan, uh, sorry, around the Tibetan and the Indian uh, subregion. They feel that by creating a more number of reservoirs and the dams, you can create opportunities for flash floods in the event of congregated flow with, within within the specific uh, domains. It's also, you saw that in, uh, we had a disaster in uh, Uttarakhand, uh, if I'm correct, which yes, is the, yes. the breakage of the avalanche and the whole thing Suddenly, there was a huge flash floods. This is a very mountainous terrain. So it is in this context they're saying there's opportunities for flooding, abnormal kind of activities that can occur. Also seismic because the whole kind of the ecosystem um, is, you know, is a very fine balance and creating more and more dams along the waterways can potentially create a problem. These are not just mere dams. These are actually hydroelectric projects which are creating electrical kind of impulses and so on and so forth as a result of um, as a result of the activity that is taking place around that area. That's why they say, yes, it's an eco-disaster, potential eco-disaster, but it is not uh, a water issue. A couple of things that come to my mind. This is all, you know, rugged territory like Himalaya terrain. There are not many people living there. And even if they produce hydroelectric electricity, I mean, it's going to be a long haul for them to take it down to Chinese plains, isn't it? This is mostly to address the strategic defense deployments that is taking place in the Tibetan region. Mm -hmm. This is not going to be for all these things are not for, um, you know, taking it to mainland China. This is all around how you create a whole ecosystem as a strategic deterrence for any point of time, Tibet to be, um, you know, made independent, autonomous, whatever you want to say. And I think if you take a look at the same chart, um, you will see Ningchi is not very far. That is the point of termination for the big railways that is right. actually coming from Lhasa to Ningchi. Right. What is that area? That area is going to be also, we're going to have a fast train which goes, which connects Lhasa to Chengdu. Again, we covered that in another topic. Yes. So check is the main line. So they really can have mass transportation of the PLA from one side to the other side. So obviously, this is all serving the strategic PLA's interest. There's also going to be bunkers and uh, temporary house holdings that are that are supposed to be constructed. You know, not too far, 11 to 21 kilometers from Indian border. So I think it is those things, it is the purpose for which these dams are being built and the usage for which it is being built is the one that is causing alarm amongst people. Mm. And the next chart shows all the different tributaries that flow into Brahmaputra. Uh, I think you said you didn't have much to talk about this one, right? Shall I go to the next slide? Yeah, yeah. all I was just trying to say is that you have Manas River, you have the um, uh, Sankosh River, you have, you can see all of this. Uh, you can have the Barnadi, you have the Kolong, you go right up to the, in the front, you have the Lohit, Dibang, Siang, uh, Buri Ding. So you have all these rivers flowing into the Brahmaputra River. So there are various tributaries which feed from either side, from the Indian side, as well as from the Tibetan side. So they say that they, the, even if there are what you call at the points of the lower reaches, the tributaries feed the river so therefore, there is no opportunity for drying of the Brahmaputra River. Okay, sir. Next one is we're going to talk about uh, China news uh, in the East China Sea. Um, the Senkaku issue, we touched upon it during Quad, saying that Ch Senkaku could be a critical uh, 
point where uh, you know us and uh, japan and uh, many of the countries around that area they are all concerned about so what do you think is going to play out next as part of quad plan there sir oh, i think that the i only would so we'll we'll do a more extensive brief in our detailed session but i want to show one chart natural gas exploration the disputed is china sea if you can please put up that map yeah i got it i got it okay so if you take a look at this area you can see that there are red dots blue dots uh, as well as uh, you know maybe we should show the other chart too but let's take the case of red dots and blue dots you can see this is now why senkaku is which is in the bottom trough of the okinawas why is it important it's very important because not too far from there is natural gas exploration in the disputed east china sea three nations are contesting japan is contesting then the second uh, um, you know korea probably will will have some say in this and then you have the china right so they are all drilling why they are drilling because again the island is strategic important because it is of its proximity from a defense point of view there are three specific earmark zones one earmark zone which is for what they call as the strategic name strategic air defense that is namely whenever you cross the territory or within the territory you have the air defense radars you know flash up either in japan or in korea or in china so you have the air defense um, zones then you have the economic development zones where you actually can do activities you can even create a temporary island you can create a zone so you have economic development and then you have the third which is this natural natural gas excavation and the drilling platforms where you have both japan as well as china in that specific area now if you take if you take a look at where taiwan is taiwan is not too far from uh, from these kind of uh, strategic grid, grid locks around the senkaku islands so th this is the reason why the senkaku and taiwan has become very important in the east china sea for contention between china taiwan and japan and uh, china intensifies cyber attacks after the disengagement at pangong so what were the new incidents that you feel could be construed as that the continued cyber attacks uh, is around the um, the government the defense there was i think we have already covered what they tried to do in the bio uh, the serum laboratories to look at the value chains and to look at um, other things of ip so both on the defense as well as on the governmental um, databases and so on there seems to be persistent kind of attacks from the chinese um, and also the, the 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 defense the defense servers and the uh, uh whatever are the uh, the radars the monitoring and all those kinds of infrastructure which is uh, by the way india is still not upgraded plans to upgrade this whole mobile telecommunication infrastructure to the next generation so it is fairly vulnerable i would say i'm sure that they would probably indian government would, uh, would would debate and argue to say that they have sufficient deterrent mechanisms in place which is what they're probably using uh to mitigate i think a lot of uh, work has been done during the the trump uh, uh, period in terms of um, augmenting india's infrastructure around that there's a new um, um auction or new procurement is being undertaken and india has made a decision not to import the next generation telecommunication infrastructure especially for communication and its defense needs and it will be using its own uh, domestic capabilities and uh, farmer agitation and a un body have confirmed that the khalistanis had donated up to 10000 dollars for the agitation so this is the hand of khalistan in the farmer agitation is now very clear uh, i think that the um, i should not interpret that way i think the farmer agitation uh, i combined the two the farmer agitation basically is going on independent 
it's very clear that based on other anecdotal evidences that the Khalistani groups are involved in supporting. And there was also a theory that uh, somehow the Punjab, uh, uh, Canada uh, uh, trade deal was impacted as a result of everything being domestic, domestic produced and domestic usage. Uh, and so perhaps this is one of the reasons why uh, that uh, this uh, farmer agitation was somehow connected to the Khalistani movement. But Khalistani movement seems to have raised its hand and indicated, which we saw in at least in a couple of cities or a couple of places in the United States, in California. We also saw that in uh, Nevada, you know, boards coming up to say that, uh, you know, Khalistani support uh, the farm agitation in India. I am told that the farmers are now building permanent infrastructures around the border area, uh, moving all the way up, to, up towards uh, for a major kind of uh, strike or a major agitation in India. That seems to be the case um, on the farmer side. Whereas the Geneva thing is saying that the Khalistanis who are now fairly active in India in this agitation, they seem to have India, either United States, United Nations uh, Human Rights Group has voluntarily come forward or at the request of India has gone public, which is to say, yes, they have received $10,000 as a donation. It's not good, not very good. Now, uh, lastly, a uh, quick look at the markets next week, sir, before we wrap up. Uh, the markets are expected to be, uh, markets are expected to be uh, gyrating again as a result of the bond deals. Um, and, uh, you know, the stocks will toggle between cyclical to the, what you call as the uh, uh, economic recovery stocks, which is the traditional kind of uh, uh, stocks other than the tech stocks. Uh, Fed Reserve meets on Tuesday and Wednesday. We may get some direction or we may get no direction on the trend of the bond markets. Uh, and uh, investor bet is actually, you know, to continue to um, be reliant on the stimulus and the progressive improvements in the economic conditions as a result of the COVID vaccines. Um, we don't have the time to put up a chart which shows basically the, the rate movements of the 10-year bond. Again, it's a fascinating thing is you can see the, uh, uh, the V-shaped um, recovery of the uh, of the yield curve is simply effect, uh, stating that when the pandemic, the interest rates dipped to 0.64, it's now around 1.6 percent. At its peak in 2019, interest rates had risen as high as 3 percent. Uh, you know, the bond yields were as high as 3 percent, and we were we forced it to bring down. They went to 3 percent because of that 2.25 percent, which we discussed. Uh, in one of the economic stimulus um, or the um, the budget programs and which President Trump was forcing it to be brought down, which is to say we are too early uh, to raise the interest rate to 2.25 percent. Then we brought it back, uh, you know, progressively. And then came the pandemic. We brought it down to zero. So this is basically saying the gyration in the bond deals because the bond vigilantes are not buying that the rates are not going to be rising. Right, that is why they're forcing the yield to go up, which in turn is creating some gyrations in the, in the stock market, and which is also creating problems in the mortgage market, because it's not the short-term rates of 1.6. The 30-year bonds is also around 2.5, 2.6%, which has grown from about 1.65% to where it is today. So it has implications in terms of how you price your mortgages. They do not want on the on the verge of a recovery, uh, the mortgage market, which is a very important market for the United States in terms of its economic outcomes, uh, to be going back into doldrums. And that's all for today, folks. We'll be back again tomorrow, bright and early, same time, same place. And uh, a reminder to all our uh, viewers from uh, outside of the United States, we have jumped forward by one hour. In, in India, we used to go live at 6.30 p.m., now we'll be going live at 5.30 p.m. We will put out uh, tweets and uh, Facebook messages to that effect. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our channel and Namaskar. Namaskar and thank you so much. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week.